I'm pretty sure I've never eaten so much food in so little time in my life as I did on the Disney Wish cruise ship. But we did it for science, specifically the science of letting you know what's worth your time and stomach space. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. In late June, our cruise team had three days to eat at all restaurants on the brand new Disney Wish Mega Ship, the biggest Disney Cruise Line ship of all time. By the way, if you want to dive into a bunch of secrets from this ship, you can watch our first Wish video right here. And now it's time to relive the chaos and I'm taking you with me. Of course, I promise to give you the tips, reviews, and heads up warnings that you'll need because this ship is huge and very different from other Disney Cruise Line ships. So there's a lot to share on the things that have changed front. You ready to dive into three unbelievable and incredible and utterly bonkers days of cruise ship eating? Buckle up and don't say I didn't warn you. Here we go. Let's start at the beginning with day one. After filming the room tour, the kids clubs, the grand hall atrium, and the sail away party, I made my first and honestly what should be everyone's first get of the cruise, ice cream. Good news, previous Disney cruisers, you can still get as much soft serve ice cream as you want, included with the cost of your cruise, up there on deck 11. The big change here is that it's no longer serve yourself. Remember, this ship was built during a pandemic, and the touchless factor is huge here, from doors to elevators to ice cream. You'll ask the cast member to make your cone for you here on The Wish. Now, ice cream achievement unlocked, and evening nigh, it was time to explore a lounge before heading to dinner. There are five indoor lounges lounges. Oh, and a hidden bourbon bar, of course, over there at the Barbary on the Wish. And don't worry, we're going to hit all of them before the end of this video. Tonight, I started with Nightingales, which is on deck three midship right off the Grand Hall Atrium. Surprised? Same. On the other Disney Cruise Line ships, the lounges are all nestled together in the far off regions of the nighttime district, whatever it's called on that particular ship. Not anymore. Three of the lounges are close to each other right off the Grand Hall. Then you have a couple up on deck for midship. The layout definitely takes some getting used to. Anyway, I popped into Nightingale's to take a few pans of B-roll when I was engaged by an utterly charming British bartender named Sam, who convinced me to try one of their specialty drinks. Now, Nightingale's is themed to Cinderella's tune Sing Sweet Nightingale, so he insisted I try the Sweet Nightingale with Hendrix Amazonia, passion fruit, rosemary, and mint. The best part, it is served in a bird glass, and yes, you get to drink out of a bird butt. What better way to start your cruise, right? This was refreshing and the passion fruit tempers that bite from the gin. So this is very drinkable, very smooth. I was a little worried about the rosemary since that's not an herb I love, but the flavor from it was very subtle. By the way, a lot of you have been asking us if you can buy these glasses at Nightingale's. You can't as far as I know, but you can get them on Amazon and we've got a blog post to show you where. I'll link it in the description. So at this point I was already late. That will be a theme here for my highly anticipated dinner at Enchante, which is helmed by three Michelin starred chef Arnaud Lallemand, sorry about that pronunciation, who also contributes to Remy on the dream and fantasy. Altogether here on deck 13, aft you've got Enchante, Palo Steakhouse, and the Rose Lounge. These are all adults only locations themed to Beauty and the Beast. The theming is very subtle though. Enchante features Lumiere, Palo Steakhouse features Cogsworth, and the Rose Lounge is of course the Enchanted Rose. At Enchante, we were led down a long dark hallway, which I guess is supposed to be like entering the Beast's castle, and it takes you into basically an antechamber to the restaurant itself. This is a bright, airy lounge, and it's where you'll begin your Enchante experience. They kind of have it as a step-by-step -step process. Here, you're gonna sit down and have a glass of champagne and a mousse-bouche from the chef. Once you're appropriately relaxed and ready for your dining adventure, you're led into the restaurant itself. Now, overall, this is a small location. Only a few tables are seated per night, and if you enjoy being pampered, then you're gonna love this. You're attended to by multiple servers, every dish is served with a flourish, and the food and experience are really, really exquisite. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Remy on the dream and the fantasy, so I wasn't really expecting to love this experience, but I did, and I'll tell you why it's a little bit different in just a second. So when you first sit down, you might be wondering what that little white thing is on the table in front of you. We were hoping they were phone chargers because to be honest, we could have really used phone chargers. But alas, this was another touchless innovation. The servers pushed these little buttons and out came basically a menu stand upon which they placed our menus. To me, this was a little bit of overkill, but hey, fancy is as fancy does. So all right, won't touch your menu. 
<laughs> Speaking of the menu, Enchante and Palo Steakhouse as well function a little differently on this ship than the adults-only restaurants function on the other Disney Cruise Line ships. Here, there are options to pay for a prefix meal, which is basically what you get on the other ships, and there are options to pay a la carte for just what you want to eat. Previously, you pay a set price to dine at Palo, found on every ship, or Remy, the counterpart to Enchante and the Dream and Fantasy. But here on The Wish, the adult-only dining has a lot more leeway and could potentially be a lot more expensive. For example, on the Disney Dream, you'll pay $125 to dine at Remy. Here at Enchante, you could easily spend twice that depending on what you want to order. Now, on this particular evening, Enchante was really enchanting, get it? I'm kind of glad we dined here on our first night, primarily because I was still naive about what I actually had to accomplish in the upcoming two days and the chaos that would ensue. So I was able to relax and enjoy the experience, but also because I was not already chock full from eating 25 other places that day. So props to the universe for this particular schedule. I was well primed to actually enjoy this very expensive, very, very long meal. Now, something to note about Enchante, our meal here took about four hours. Seriously, four hours. Did we order a lot and have a really good time? Yes, we did. Did we outstay several other tables? Indeed. But please, if you decide to splurge on Enchante, plan to truly enjoy your meal. Don't rush through it. Don't be shy about asking about the dishes and the menu, where the food is from, why they chose to create it that way. It's all truly fascinating stuff to discuss with your servers and the chef. Speaking of, since we were on the christening cruise, the chef himself was there. Just like in other celebrity chef restaurants, usually the headliner chef isn't at the helm in the kitchen. He's off doing chefy things at his other restaurants. But on this particular evening, Chef Lallemand was in house. He visited our table several times wearing jeans because he's a complete baller and we love him to sauce our dishes which sounds super weird, but in fact is completely literal. He brought the sauces for what we ordered and sauced the food at the table. Now, I'm a huge sauce fan, we all know this, and the chef left the sauce on the table for us to use more sauce if we wanted it. OMG, y'all. I've been at fancy restaurants where the chef refused to put salt or pepper on the table because they knew their food was perfect as is. But this three-star Michelin chef was like, you know what? You can have salt, pepper, and the sauce if you want more sauce because, hey, man, you know what you like, and I want you to be happy. Now, come on. That is a restaurant worth paying big bucks for, and I got to give props to Chef Lalmont, even though I can't say his name. Anyway, we ate a ton of food, a ton of cheese, a ton of dessert, and had an incredible time during all of it. And we have a lot to cover in this video, and my editor is already telling me I'm droning on too long about this, so I won't go into every single dish. We have a full, very long blog post on DisneyFoodBlog.com where you can read about each and every item, and that way you don't have to suffer through me pronouncing their names. But here's a tip if you're scared of fancy restaurants. Don't be. They want you to be happy, so ask all the questions you have, be honest about what you want to eat, because don't pay for fish eggs if you don't want fish eggs, and make sure you enjoy yourself. You are paying for it, you deserve it. Okay, so after our four hours of continuous dining, it was time to crash and prepare for the epic next two days. Get ready for two dinners per day going forward, y'all. And way too many visits to Mickey's Smokehouse Barbecue for some reason. I don't know why they let me go there so many times. Good morning from day two. So after an evening of too much delicious food, I was scheduled for a 5.50 a.m. interview to drink. Yep, I got the incredible opportunity to see inside the story of the week, Hyperspace Lounge, and see the legendary Roland create the lounge's signature drinks. Now let's talk a little bit about Hyperspace Lounge, which is easily one of the most unique lounge concepts in Disney Cruise Line. It's all IP based, which you don't really find in too many lounges on the previous ships. And on The Wish, you have some loose themes of Cinderella and Tiana in some lounges, but nothing this on the nose. So Hyperspace Lounge is a little different as well in that you may need a reservation to go there. Currently, you can't book your reservation before you sail, so when you get on The Wish, be sure to head to Hyperspace and see if they are taking reservations. If so, be sure to book one before they sell out. And the space here is really small, and when they're using reservations, you may only have 45 minutes in here as they were limiting the time on my cruise. So Hyperspace Lounge is modeled after Dryden Voss's ship from the Solo film, which means you'll be stepping aboard a pretty stylish 
stylish looking star cruiser. This lounge kind of reminds me of Space 220 and Epcot on a much, much smaller scale with less food and more hyperspeed. Similar to Space 220, you'll be able to look through virtually enhanced windows, quote unquote. Not similar to Space 220, these windows will show you zooming past several planets, we're talking a new planet every seven minutes, and over 40 different spaceships from the Star Wars franchise. During the day, cruisers of all ages can swing by the lounge just to check out the atmosphere, but once evening rolls around, this lounge transforms into an adults-only experience where guests 21 and older are going to be able to order a bunch of space-themed cocktails. And it's all about presentation here. Your cocktail could be made in an impressive-looking smoking contraption, or you might find a message written in edible glow light ink across the foam of your drink when you order something like the Birkin's Flow, which is a great option for those if you like chocolatey and super sweet mixed drinks. And the reason why this was the story of the week is, of course, that $5,000 kyber crystal drink. If you have $5,000 bucks burning a hole in your pocket, you can get this one, which not only comes with a cocktail served in a glowing Camtono canister, but it also gives you four silver cups, a Star Wars backpack, hey, water bottle, hyperspace lounge room decor, a bottle of sparkling wine from Skywalker Ranch, and a voucher for one person to visit Skywalker Ranch, which is, yes, in California. But that's far and away the most expensive cocktail that's served here. Everything else is pretty standard in terms of Disney alcohol prices. If you've ever been to one of the Trader Sam's locations on either side of the country, that's about the price range you're looking at. Now, something else that's really cool about Hyperspace Lounge that I don't want you to miss, and that Roland told me about, is that behind your bartender, there is a whole lineup of spirits, which you usually find in a lounge. Here though, all of the bottles are labeled in Arabesh, which of course is a language used in Star Wars. And so if you're looking at those and you don't speak Arabesh, then you're not gonna be able to tell what's in those bottles. But Roland knows, and all the other bartenders know, they just have to memorize what is in each of those bottles. And I think that's just a fascinating detail that you'll never realize unless you asked about it, right? Now let's get into these drinks a little bit. These are not gonna be as bachelorette party as you have at Oga's Cantina in Galaxy's Edge. There is a little more edginess here, but I'm gonna be honest with you, it's not much edgier. So one of our favorites here is the Spire Sunset. This is made with Saigon Bagur, kumquat, lychee, and coconut. It's a great combo of sweet, tart, and smooth. We also tried a few other concoctions. The Chancellor is one of the ones I got to drink at 5.50 a.m. Very smoky, pretty harsh in terms of flavors. The golden one was like drinking an orange creamsicle. The asteroid belt's a fun little swirled chocolate accent piece sticking out the top. And the Freetown Reserve, another one I got to drink at 5.50 in the morning, starts with a sparkling blue ice cube with glitter in it. It transforms into a very potent and smoky cocktail. Now, in order to make reservations, you can swing by Hyperspace Lounge during the day and get your group on the list for that evening. Sometimes the list for the evening might already be booked up, though, and you'll have to make your reservation for later. So it's super important to hit up the lounge on day one and secure your spot. Otherwise, if you wait until the very last day of your cruise, you could be out of luck. Now, after my 5.50 a.m. interview, it was time for breakfast. And on this morning, I chose the buffet, Marceline Market. This is a very similar restaurant style to what you'll find at the buffet destination cabanas on the other four Disney Cruise Line ships. But a big difference here is that Marceline Market's options and overall theming is based around Walt Disney and 10 of his animated films, including Tangled, Ratatouille, Zootopia, Beauty and the Beast, and those 10 films are repped as 10 food stalls wrapped around the ship's outline. Now, for all you Disney experts out there, you probably already know the significance behind the Marceline Market name. Marceline pays tribute to Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline, Missouri, which is represented through the farmhouse style atmosphere here. But you're not just gonna find farmhouse accents around the food hall. There are plenty of nods to those 10 animated Disney films. It's kind of like a search and find to see how many little nods to Disney characters and storylines you can find displayed in the cabinets and artwork, the signs and the pictures. It's weird because there are technically a lot of different decor vibes going on around this restaurant. There's floral and steampunk and woodwork, but it's all very tasteful and it flows pretty naturally from one section of the food hall to the next. I was kind of impressed too with the detail in the light fixtures that look like 
a set of milk bottles. I thought that was super fun. Now, Marceline Market's got a lot of seating, a lot. So don't worry about scrambling to find a place to sit or feeling the need to save a table for your group. Even if you have a big group you're traveling with, you're going to still find a seat. And honestly, my favorite part about Marceline Market is the section at the far end of the restaurant, right across from the brand new coffee bar at Marceline Market. And this is the area themed to Maurice from Beauty and the Beast. It's nice and private and a great place to get a little extra work done or read a chapter of your book or even just take it easy and chill for a second away from everyone else. So as far as the food is concerned, you got a nice buffet style set up here in a self-serve beverage bar with sodas and juice. So help yourself. Remember, it's all included. So refill to your heart's content. And because there are 10 food stalls, you're gonna have a lot to choose from. You got American classics like chicken tenders and fries, international specialties like chicken tikka masala, rigatoni pasta, comfort foods, mac and cheese, chicken pot pie, and seafood soups, salads, vegetarian and plant-based eats, baked goods, desserts. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot that you can try it. And in the morning, Marceline's making Mickey waffles. There are a spread of other breakfast goodies. You've got cream of wheat, sometimes oatmeal. We even found egg fried rice and miso kanji, which definitely gave me Raya vibes. So breakfast completed, I had to pop over to a few more media event interviews, which included interviewing some chefs about the rotational dining on the ship. Now the rotational dining makes Disney Cruise Line a little different from what you'll find on other cruise lines. So I'm gonna talk about that for just a little bit here. When you pay for passage on the Disney Wish or any of the Disney Cruise Line ships, it includes your stateroom price, but also your rotational dining. Now the rotational dining doesn't mean that your restaurants spin like Garden Grill. What it means is that there are three themed dining venues included in the price of your cruise, and you're gonna experience them all via a schedule in your Navigator app, which is basically the My Disney Experience app of the cruise line world. This schedule will tell you which restaurant you'll dine at and what times you'll dine there for each day of your trip. And although the restaurants you dine at each evening will change, your server will not. Between the three different restaurants, you'll have the same servers rotating with you. So basically, they're gonna become your BFFs aboard the ship. They'll know all about your dining preferences, including allergies, general distastes, which dishes you're gonna wind up asking for seconds of, yes, that's totally allowed, and what you're gonna to wanna to drink. And they're gonna have those drinks ready for you before you even get to your table each night. Now, when you check in for your cruise, you can choose between early seating around 5.45 and late seating around 8.15. If you complete online check-in early enough, this is gonna be your choice. But if you're late to the game, you may have to take what's left over. So we're gonna hit up the rotational dining restaurants, Arendelle, Marvel, and 1923 in a bit. But first, it's time to head on to island time. Yep, today was the day the ship was docked at Castaway Key, Disney's private island in the Bahamas. But fear not, the island does furnish some sustenance and it mostly consists of rum. Just kidding, but there was definitely a lot of rum. We won't go too much into detail here because Castaway Key doesn't change at all depending on which ship is docked there. Whether you're on the magic, the wonder, the dream, the fantasy, the wish, you're getting pretty much the same conch cooler and burgers regardless of how much you paid for your cruise. When you're on Castaway, Lunch is served from around 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's mostly island barbecue cafeteria style meets outdoor picnic. Think burgers, ribs, potato chips, cornbread, cold salads, and a few portable desserts like muffins and little cakes. There are three spots for barbecue here. Two of them, cookies and cookies too, serve the same menu. Of course, the self-serve soft serve ice cream is still going strong on the island, and yep, you still get to make your own cones out here. And there's a lovely little stand for fresh fruit as well. I had some very fresh plums here that I was happy about. Now, if you head over to Serenity Bay, which is the adults only area of the island, there's still outdoor picnic barbecue, but here you might get some steak and a few other options as well. For alcoholic consumables on Castaway, you've got lots of bars and they've got fun island drink menus as well as full bars to order whatever you fancy. There's also a cute little smoothie bar, Olaf themed, where you can spend lots of money on an Olaf sipper and there's a stand to get Mickey shaped snow cones as well. On the island, barbecue and ice cream are free. The rest is an extra cost. By the way, I went snorkeling on Castaway Key for the first time, and I'm not gonna lie, 
that Prince Eric statue that they added out there is very sketchy. And yes, I'm mentioning this solely so that it was worth it that I swam all the way out there to where Prince Eric is and worth it that I bought that Disney Cruise Line pouch thing for my phone that cost $17 even with my Castaway Club discount that keeps it waterproof when I take videos underwater. I'm still not sure it was worth it, but I thought you should see this either way. Now, back in action and back to eating. We headed back to the ship. Do not call it a boat. They get very, very mad. And I went straight up to Deck 11 to indulge a little at Joyful Sweets, the inside out themed candy and gelato store on the ship. So why did I choose this particular time to cover this joint? Well, honestly, it's all your fault. When I was last on the Disney Dream, I went to Vanellope's Candy Store on Castaway Key Day and took some gorgeous photos, if I do say so myself, with that blue water in the background. And whenever I post those on Instagram, y'all just love them and so do I. So I wanted to repeat that feat. So here we go to Joyful Sweets. Now, is there a reason why you should pay extra for desserts when there are so many already included on The Wish? Yes. Yes, there is. This place brings their dessert A game by serving over the top gelatos, macarons, cupcakes, cake pops, ganache, and more. And most of them are super good. The treats here are vibrant and colorful like they are at other Disney Cruise Line candy stores. But what I liked about this spot was that I didn't feel overwhelmed with choices. Even though I know there's lots, there's lots of choices, but I wasn't bombarded with it the way I was at Vanellope's. Here, there's space to spread out and move around and it feels airier and a little bit more boutique, like they only serve the best of the best. I don't know, I'm just telling you what my vibe was. So we tried several items here, including the character cupcakes themed after inside out characters, the core memory balls, Captain Mickey cupcakes, ganache and gelato. And the character cupcakes had a white chocolate mousse on top instead of frosting, which a lot of you will love because a lot of you are anti-frosting for some reason. But I think it's a cop out because I wanted straight buttercream. Luckily, I found it on the Captain Mickey and Captain Minnie cupcakes. Rich, thick buttercream on vanilla cupcakes. Plain and simple, but perfect. And so perfect that maybe I bought two more the next day and never you mind. Now, the gelato was the favorite of some of my team members and my peanut butter ganache was decent, but the peanut butter had almost a caramel texture. It was weird, I didn't love it. Those core memory balls are what the kids are gonna love though. Those are chocolate and they crack open to reveal tons of candy like Skittles and sprinkles and more, very pinata-like. And they also will soon have bing bong sundaes, but due to shipping delays, they literally only had one bing bong sundae bowl when we were there, so they weren't selling him yet. Now, even if you don't plan on buying anything here, it's still worth popping your head in and checking out the fun sculptures and the color scheme, the memory displays, take in all of that gelato, which is amazing to look at, and shout out to my friend Enrique, who I met when I was covering the dream and has since moved over to the wish. That was another fun part of this cruise, chatting with so many crew members who were superstars on other ships and made the move over to this new mega ship. Huge kudos to those crew members. Shout out to my buddy Glenn too. I don't know if Glenn watches my videos, but he's my buddy and, and I'm shouting out in case any of you do watch the videos and you know Glenn. Okay, now it's time to mention for the first time my personal indulgence on this ship. And no, it's not the Captain Mickey cupcakes. I told you, you never heard a thing. Now, I have no idea why, except yes, I do, but I found myself going back to Mickey's Smokestack Barbecue 17 times on this ship when there was no reason to do so. Why could I not resist the sausage and mac and cheese and brisket and the house barbecue sauce? Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin at the beginning. Let's say you're out sunning on the upper level, deck 11, having a marvelous time, splashing around in one of the many pools. Now, if you don't want to change out of your swimwear to dine inside for lunch, but not gonna lie, I went to Marceline Market in a bathing suit more than once, then you're gonna wanna track down some reliable outdoor dining. And that's where Mickey and friends are here to help. These are those Deck 11 quick service spots, burgers, fries, the famous chicken tenders I love so much. But this time around, they are different, y'all. And I can't tell you how fantastic this little section of the ship is. Those of you who are longtime cruisers are gonna be so thrilled with these changes. There's Daisy's Pizza Pies, Goofy's Grill for your burger and chicken tender and hot dog needs, Sweet Minnie's Ice Cream, which we already discussed because unlimited ice cream is the dream that the Disney Cruise Line continues to fulfill time and again. And there are two new stations that turn the standard cruise line quick service offerings on their head. 
Donald's Cantina serves up build your own tacos, burritos, and bowls. And this is the first ever quick service Mexican inspired spot aboard a Disney cruise. It's basically Chipotle meets Taco Bell. And Mickey's Smokestack Barbecue, my new boyfriend, is Disney Cruise Line's first quick service barbecue eatery. So there are four big things I want you to take away from Festival of Foods. One, it's open early and stays open late. So it's going to be your trusty steed when the hunger strikes up at an unpredictable time. Two, it's all included, so eat up. Three, it's the best selection of outdoor quick service offerings across the entire Disney Cruise Line, period. Especially with Donald's new knockoff Chipotle station added to the mix. And even though Daisy's pizza pies are pretty basic, they're not weird and pillowy like you're gonna find back on land at Pizza Rizzo. That's right, Rizzo, I'm coming for you, even out at sea. Now four, if your hometown is in a region of the world where barbecue is like kind of their thing, Put your hate away and still love this place. I live in Texas. I still remain enamored with Mickey's smokestack situation. The brisket is just fatty enough and moist and delicious. The mac and cheese is baked in rectangular pans so that every serving has crispy breadcrumbs on top. That is very important. The sausage is excellent and my favorite. There's all the cornbread you want, though it's jalapeno cornbread, which isn't my favorite, but whatever. And so much more. Plus the sweet potato fries here do not mess around. Anyway, I loved all these spots so very much. I think you will too. And I literally went back here probably four or five times unnecessarily, y'all. You see how much food I'm eating on this cruise. <laughs> Why in the world am I doing that to myself? It's because it's there, it's free, and it's amazing. I will not step down from this. I will not. Alrighty, back to running around the ship for more footage gathering, media events, interviews, and B-roll gathering. So much B-roll. Our reporter Megan was very proud of us, weren't you, Megan? And it was soon time for dinners. Yes, dinners, because now we're into the portion of this cruise where in order to eat everywhere, I need to eat two dinners per night. This is usually my MO on cruises that I'm covering for work because there's no other way to manage getting all the coverage I need. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. Now, here's a note and a disclaimer. You as a regular cruiser and not media covering for work likely won't have the option to do two rotational dining meals per night. Not that you would necessarily want to. The restaurants do fill up and it can be hard and annoying and messy for the crew members to slap people where where they aren't slated to go. That said, if you do for some reason want to eat two dinners in one night, you can always book an adults only restaurant at five and then go to your rotational dining location at 8.15. That's what I did on the third night of the cruise. Stay tuned. All right, so we started tonight at Avengers World of Marvel. Worlds of Marvel was probably the most hyped up restaurant for The Wish before the mega ship ever set sail. After all, this is the first ever Marvel themed dinner experience, which promises lots of immersive elements alongside Ant-Man and the Wasp. Come on, saving the world while eating a lot of food? This sounds like the moment I was born for. And the promotional videos promised I would get a cupcake that's grown through PIM technology to be bigger than my head. But here's the thing. I had a much better time at my next dinner in Arendelle than I did during the Worlds of Marvel experience. Now, I'm not saying the Worlds of Marvel experience was bad. This is still an impressive restaurant with lots of cool digital aspects and fan favorite characters from the MCU, a lot of them. And the storyline is a neat premise too. Basically, you're at an Avengers technology showcase where Ant-Man and the Wasp are gonna show off some high-powered superhero tech. And honestly, if you're not in love with Paul Rudd, I don't even know why we're friends. But when I first heard about this restaurant, I thought a lot of this immersive experience was gonna happen right in front of you. And in a way it does, but it happens on giant screens. This restaurant is the analog to animator's palette on the other ships. So you got those giant screens from Turtle Talk with Crush scattered around. And the fact that the tech wasn't happening right on my table was, I guess, disappointing based on the promotional material. I don't know, I kind of thought there'd be more magic trick elements going on. I mean, you get these impressive looking quantum cores on your table and you're told that they can cause things on the ship or even the ship itself to shrink or grow. So I thought that was gonna be a big element during the meal. And I really did think that my cupcake was gonna get as big as my head. But really, they didn't play a huge part in the overall experience except during a few parts where you press the button. Otherwise, they were just kind of there. Also, there is a character element here. It's mostly just Ant-Man and the Wasp walking quickly through the restaurant waving at people while they say pre-recorded things. You won't meet them or get autographs or anything, so make sure you've got your cameras ready to take pictures fast. And even though this experience does mostly take place on screens, the intimate setting does help everyone to see everything, so you don't have to worry about little ones missing out on the action. 
But here's the positive part about all of this. Even though the entertainment in Arendelle is more hoppin', I'd probably say the food at Worlds of Marvel was more enjoyable for me. The foods featured here fell into this comfort zone area, but a little bit exotic, then nothing's too adventurous or too safe. Instead, it's a lot of familiar flavors with unique twists. The steamed bao buns, for instance, with the seared ginger orange pork belly wasn't overpoweringly ginger, just gingery enough to give the pork belly a subtle zing that made it stand out from other traditional bao buns we've tried in the past. We loved these. The chicken schnitzel also had a different lemony zest to it, which made it taste really fresh. It was a great little storm of sweet and savory. Now, this is from other ships. You've probably already had it, but again, it's really good. I also enjoyed the ribeye here, even though mine was served room temperature, unfortunately. The flavors were right, though. The gnocchi was a nice alternative to a meat dish. It did have a lot of flavor as well. Overall, the innovation with this menu was fun and well done. And yes, we did try just about everything on the menu because that's totally allowed at these rotational dining locations if you feel up to it. Feel free to pick and choose from all areas of the menu. Two appetizers and a dessert? Fine. Two entrees instead of a three-course menu? Okie dokie. It's the wonders of cruising. Now, the desserts here were pretty average. Again, there was some hope for the Dolce de Leche ice cream, but the donut on top was just too basic and bland for our liking. We tried all the things, the cheesecake, etc., but blah, right? And as far as the extra priced cocktails here are concerned, if you're looking for a strong drink, you're gonna have a heyday with these. They don't call it the Widow's Bite cocktail for nothing. That gin does pack a punch. And the Mezcal featured in the Stinger cocktail, also very smoky and powerful. So if you're worried about the wish skimping out on your booze, don't be. However, just like I mentioned earlier when talking about the drinks over in Arendelle, there are other places you can also get beverages that may help break up that alcohol flavor a little better if that's what you're looking for. And if you've got kids or kids at heart in your group, consider ordering the smoothie that comes in the Quantum Core Sipper. This light up take home sipper is one of the more fun souvenir options here. I think it's very unique. All in all, Worlds of Marvel might have some better food options, but you're probably gonna have a better time singing and joking along with the Frozen cast over at Arendelle, a frozen dining adventure. So let's head there next. Yep, we headed from first dinner seating at Marvel to second dinner seating at Arendelle, a frozen dining adventure where we were seated right next to the stage, OMG. Honestly, best seats in the house, but let's set that stage for a second. So have you heard the news? Anna and Kristoff are getting married. Eating at Arendelle, a frozen dining adventure is like getting invited to an engagement party you're not dreading. Everything here is fun. Seeing Oaken hosting guests for the first time in forever is fun. Joining in with all the sing-alongs is fun. Trying to figure out why Kristoff and Oaken sing Elsa's famous Let It Go song is baffling, but very fun and funny. And there's never a dull moment when you're dining here, so you don't have to worry about your younger or even older kids getting bored. The characters even throw out quite a few jokes for the adults to enjoy too, and our table was busting up laughing several times throughout the meal. Now the restaurant itself is gorgeous and looks exactly like the inside of the Arendelle castle. You've seen Anna running back and forth in, ranting about 8,000 salad plates and whatever during the film. So you're gonna see lots of deep reds and greens along with all the family portraits Anna sings to in the film, hang in there Joan, and full metal suits of armor. The one thing that might throw you off about this experience is the meet and greet aspect of it. Be warned. If you're thinking every Frozen character is gonna have the chance to swing by your table and have a full on conversation with you, you're gonna wind up disappointed. We got to chat with Anna and Kristoff, they were delightful, but Elsa never came to our table and neither did Olaf. Instead, the characters kind of weave around the dining room, but it is huge in there, and there's no way they'd be able to talk to everybody and still do the show. So just be prepared for this to not be your average character dining experience. That said, if you have a kiddo who needs to meet one of the characters specifically, let your server know and they may be able to make a magical moment happen, but no guarantees. So in terms of food, it's good and there are a few standouts, but the whole menu isn't a home run, so pay attention. Now, the Blushing Oaken's chilled white and green asparagus, which might seem like it's going to be a boring appetizer, was well cooked and actually flavorful and of course served cold. Elsa's royal baked scallops also came out in a buttery, light and fluffy pastry that I would totally order in a heartbeat if I saw it in my local bakery. But the pan-seared Chilean sea bass was the table favorite of the meal. And it makes sense, right? Because this is brought over from several of the other Disney ships. It's light and flaky with scallops on the side and fresh veggies. It was all really, really good stuff. And I loved the prime rib and the pork medallions even after eating a full meal at Marvel. The desserts again were meh here like they were at Marvel. No big standouts on the list. 
And though alcoholic beverages aboard the ship are not included with your cruise line price, as you know, you can still pay extra to grab yourself a concoction or two. And the drinks featured at Arendelle, at the risk of sounding like a broken record here, are good drinks but not great drinks. The frozen fractals cocktail made with Ciroc, peach, and Moet and Chandon ice was sparkly the first time we ordered it with literally glitter in it, but the next time there was no glitter, none. All pizzazz, just poof, one way. Still tasted okay, but glitter was definitely the most unique element about this. So if you want to save your drink splurge on a more exciting mixed drink later on, maybe in one of the lounges, there are plenty of other places to do that. If you've been on a Disney Cruise Line ship before, then this frozen themed restaurant is a lot like Tiana's Place on the Disney Wonder or Rapunzel's Royal Table on the Disney Magic. It's the most fun you're gonna have dining and the food is very accessible, but is it gonna be the best food ever? Possibly not. Okay, it's time for pirate night, my friends. So out to the deck, me hearties, for a swashbuckling fireworks show. And I'm sorry, I'm really bad at pirate speak, but the show was cool. I just wish there had been more actual Disney characters included than just Captain Jack Sparrow. Maybe there will be in the future. But this video is about the food, so I'll take you back inside where we wound up in the evening when we realized we couldn't get into Hyperspace Lounge without a reservation, which we made for the following night. We went right next door to the bayou. Now we'd heard they had beignets, so we had to try them. Though the Disney Wonder might have an entire themed rotational dining experience based around Princess and the Frog, the Disney Wish does have a bite-sized version of that at the Bayou. The Bayou is a casual lounge inspired by Princess and the Frog with three important aspects, beignets, booze, and jazzy tunes. But this isn't your average swamp-like setting. This place is themed up and has a ceiling dripping with artificial greenery and magnolia blossoms and fireflies. It kind of looks like a Michael's exploded in here. And you'll find even more fruity cocktails, though I wouldn't say any of the options I tried were extraordinary by any means. Many of those fruity drinks that we tried here tasted a lot like standard vacation drinks, like the syrupy types, which isn't a bad thing, depending. But I can recommend the Hurricane if you're going for something that suits the theme. As far as the beignets go, we've We've definitely had better in both Disneyland, Disney World, and New Orleans itself. So I don't know if I can quite recommend the splurge on these, especially if you were hoping for beignets that are served fresh and warm and pillowy. These did not meet those criteria. However, what does blow us away here is the live jazz music that plays at the bayou sometimes. So if you want to chill in a laid back lounge away from the kids, wrap up your day with a saxophone solo or two, then the bayou is your place to do that. Okay, now we've got a whole day to go, but don't forget, if you want to learn more exclusive secrets about the Disney Wish, we've got that entire pamphlet you can check out on your own time that's chock full of hidden tips, especially for the newest ship on the Disney Cruise Line fleet. You want to check it out at the link in the description below. All right, good morning from day three. This is our last day on the ship and we have a lot left to do. Now, say you wanted to sleep in and have breakfast in bed, done and done. If you open the little drawer in the desk in your room, you'll find a breakfast menu like you do in some hotels where you can check the box of what you want to eat and hang it on your door the evening before. Your breakfast will be delivered at the time you request, easy peasy. Now this isn't exactly the same as the room service on the ship, which is a different menu of lunch and dinner items. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. But first, let's be honest with each other and admit that I did not have the opportunity to sleep in on this voyage. I have things to do, but they are wonderful and amazing things. And my first order of business today was swimming. No joke, and it gets even better. See, this was July in the Caribbean and it was hot, so the pools were crowded all day long. I figured the best time to get the experience of swimming on the ship would be when everyone else was still sleeping early in the morning. So I got up, threw on a swimsuit, and headed to the cove, the adults only relaxation area of the ship. On the wish, this is a little different than it was on the other ships. Here, the cove adults only area is at the very back which means the kids don't need to cut through the area to get to the staircase or elevators like they do on the other ship this adults only area is very truly adults only the cove area is dominated by an infinity pool looking out over the back of the ship truly gorgeous and much better than the cove pool on other ships that don't have much of a view at all the cove lounge and cove cafe are close by so you're welcome to grab a cocktail try the infinity swirl with dole whip or coffee and pastries to start your morning if you like me want the infinity pool all to yourself. Cove Cafe on the ship, by the way, feels a little smaller than it does on other ships, and that might just be due to layout. Oh, and speaking of coffee, there has been a coffee revolution on The Wish. There are loads of places to get specialty coffee here, more than ever before, and you will want to pay extra for the Disney Wish coffee shops and lounges. Yes, there's free coffee aboard this ship, and yes, all soft drinks are included with the price of your cruise, 
But those specialty coffees will make you shell out some cash. And there are several places to do it. Wishing Star Cafe, Enchanted Sword Cafe, over there at Cove Cafe, and the Marceline Market Cafe, along with some of the lounges on this ship. They have coffee drinks that will cost extra. Not all of them, but if you want a coconut caramel latte with Tinkerbell on top, then it's time to pull out your wallet. So let's figure out why you'd want to stray from the free stuff for a bit and funnel more money into your beverages aboard the Wish. Well, we'll use Wishing Star Cafe as the example here since that's a spot we frequented and one that our readers are particularly interested in. Wishing Star Cafe is on deck four of the Disney Wish midship and is themed after the wishing star from Pinocchio that Jiminy Cricket sings about in that really pretty and really high falsetto voice. There is very limited seating here, but all seating is first come first serve, so you might have a tricky time getting your caffeine fix in the morning when everyone else is scrambling to do the very same thing. You can add a variety of different flavors to spruce up your latte, or you can swing by later in the day to grab a cocktail, whatever floats your boat or ship, whatever floats your ship. The lattes here are really, really good, especially since you can combine your favorite flavors to make the ultimate latte concoction. And of course, like I said, you can add some fun latte art to your drink as well. They have that little ripple machine that can put artwork on top of your foam. So coffee, free. Fancy coffee, extra. But it's good to know it's there. All right, now that we have our caffeine in order, we've had a lovely time in the infinity pool, which basically consisted of me hanging out for about 11 minutes, filming these B-roll shots and taking photos before I headed back into action. And it was time to tackle the snow cones. Nope, I'm not even kidding. Wheezy's Freezies is a snow cone spot on the wish and we're nothing if not comprehensive. So this spot is next to the kids splash zone on the ship, deck 12, and these are included with your cruise purchase. So go ahead, pick a flavor, any flavor. When we were there, there were six different snow cone syrups available, including watermelon, pineapple, raspberry, peach, coconut, and strawberry. But you don't have to stick with just one flavor. Order a bunch, make yourself a fruity tropical concoction. And there's also a selection of toppings you can choose to pile on too for a little bit of extra flavor and texture. And by the way, this spot is also basically a bar. So while the rest of my team grabbed snow cones, I went for a Dole Whip and rum situation instead. I know it's still morning, but hey, I was drinking dry ice space drinks yesterday at 5 50 a.m. So time has lost all meaning by this point. Now we should talk a little bit about Dole Whip here as well. As you know, the pineapple and sometimes other flavors soft serve that is trademark as Dole Whip is beloved in the parks and it can be found in float form usually or in drinks on other ships. Because not everything was quite up and running on the wish when I was there, these were preview cruises after all. It wasn't as prevalent as it was on other ships, but it's my impression that it will be available on the wish as well. And my Dole Whip and Rum cocktail was more slushy Dole Whip than soft serve, but it did the job and it was definitely delicious. Alrighty, next it was time for a visit to yet another lounge, Keg and Compass. One of my team members had scheduled a beer tasting here, so I headed over to explore, and yes, the beer tasting was in the morning. Heads up that beer tastings, wine tastings, rum and gin and whiskey tastings tastings, those can be scheduled via your Disney Cruise Line Navigator app. They cost extra, of course, beer tastings about 45 bucks, which ain't nothing, but are a fun activity for grown-ups, especially on a sea day. Now, I love Keg and Compass. This is probably my favorite lounge on the ship for multiple reasons. Not just the fact that the croc and octopus things around the portholes are holding Mickey waffles and Mickey bars and Dole Whips, which they totally are. This place is very homey. It's very comfortable and warm and relaxing. It's got a seafarer pub feel with some Society of Explorers and Adventurers vibes thrown in, including a seafarer's map of the world on the ceiling. Look for Easter eggs here too. You'll see Carl Fredrickson's house floating on over to South America, Tay Ka looking awfully agitated over in the Pacific Ocean, and well, I won't give everything away. But if you're someone who still can't get over the closure and replacement of the Maelstrom ride that used to live in the Norway Pavilion at Epcot, then you might openly sob when you finally spot the sign on the wall with the quote, you are not the first to pass this way, nor shall you be the last. Nice touch, Disney, nice touch. But let's talk menu here. You got a lot of drink options, ranging from specialty beers to meads to wines and a few cocktails too, though this is definitely more of a beer place and less of a fruity drink destination. And you've got a robust selection of pub grub here too. This is pretty much the place to go if you're looking for sustenance and you're tired of Marceline Market and Mickey's Barbecue. Not possible. 
But seriously, I was pretty pleased with my loaded tots, giant pretzel and dipping sauces, mustard and beer cheese, by the way, and bread pudding, which unfortunately needed to be cooked through a bit more because it was still frozen in the middle. But hey, they're working on the kinks. But my favorite thing I had here was the bangers and mash. So hearty, so delicious. Honestly, one of the best things I ate on the ship altogether. Y'all know I'm pretty easily pleased when it comes to comfort food, but don't sleep on the bangers and mash. Savory, oniony, gravy, rich potatoes, those super flavorful sausages it was just great. Now overall, this lounge is a great destination for those who want to try a variety of different beers and hang out in a pub-like setting, while also tracking down some fun Disney details hidden throughout the decor. And don't forget that there are often crafts happening here for families during the day. But be warned, it can get awfully rowdy here come 9 p.m. and on, so if you want a quieter beer drinking experience, you may want to hit this place up earlier in the evening rather than late at night. That's kind of true of all the lounges. Now, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here because I'm meant to be talking about all the food on the ship, and the one thing I did not eat while I was there on this cruise was room service. But my teammates, who were eating everything as well, mind you, took the baton on this one and graciously ordered chicken tenders and fries, as we all should do. Room service on all the Disney Cruise Line ships is 24-7 and offers some good options if you're just needing a little time alone. The menu on the Wish is very similar to those on the rest of the ships too, so if you're used to ordering the international cheese plate on the Magic, you'll get pretty much the same thing, including the Baby Bell, on the Wish. Chicken tenders and fries, same as what you'd get up at Goofy's on Deck 11, and you can also order drinks in bulk like Diet Coke cans. Dasani water bottles and more and while the food is free from room service the drinks are not soda cans and water bottles and any cocktails or alcohol will be added to your bill and you'll have the option to tip your server as they drop off your order note that there is a BOGO offer on non-alcoholic drinks though usually buy four get one free so if you're buying 20 bottles of water you'd get four of them for free and since hauling up to deck 11 to get fresh water all day can be a hindrance I'd highly recommend bringing a water bottle I carried my insulated Gatorade squeeze bottle around with me all day and refilled it water spigots and bottle fillers whenever I saw them or you can order a round of water bottles from room service when you first arrive you can put those in your little cooling drawer in your room assuming your Mickey cupcakes aren't already in in there like mine most definitely were not and have cold water whenever needed now the next thing i did after roaming the ship and gathering b-roll of the teen zones and merchandise locations and more was to go back to mickey smokehouse barbecue but that's not what i'm going to talk about right now because i already did now i'm going to mention that late afternoon and evening are a great time to ride the brand new attraction at sea the aqua mouse this water coaster has hugely long lines all day long, but if you tackle it right before dinner or while everyone is at the early show and early dinner, you can likely stay right on your raft and ride a few times in a row. Just a tip that might help you out while I am absolutely not eating mac and cheese and brisket. And I did not tell Cassie who was with me to physically remove the tray from the table at this point. Okay, we are down to our last evening on the ship and we are very, very full, but this is a sprint, not a marathon. So it's time to eat again. Let's do the math. What do we have left to do? Palo Steakhouse, which is an adults only dining option at 615, getting cocktails at the Rose beforehand, of course, and 1923, our third and final rotational dining location at 815. Oh, and we've got a reservation for Hyperspace Lounge at 930. Plus we've got to see the show that's debuting tonight and pop into the Grand Hall to catch the Chandelier show as well. So so this is when we got our time turner. Okay, we don't really have a time turner, but our team did make quite a few jokes about the truth that Buckbeak the Hippogriff would likely not be saved if it was up to us tonight. Somehow we did it all though, even though Cassie had to literally take video and photos of her steak at Palo and ran down to get the chandelier show while I took video of the desserts and then ran down to check in and order the first course at 1923 and then run back up to try dessert at Palo and settle the bill while Cassie went down to watch the show and then get to 1923 in time to video the appetizers. I won't continue on this path for you since it's likely very boring, but by the time we got to Hyperspace Lounge that night, we felt very proud and accomplished indeed, and very, very lucky that this is our job. Anyway, let's talk about the food. We started this evening with a little dose of heaven at the Rose Lounge, which connects Palo and Enchante in the Beauty and the Beast themed adults only dining part of the ship. Along with a selection of cocktails, wines, and super small selection of small bites that come straight from the Enchante menu, you can also order a spot of tea. We tried the Mrs. Tea, which came out in the cutest little teacup and saucer, which was delightful. It tasted light and floral, and I definitely order it again in a heartbeat. So if you're more of a hot tea drinker, this might be a better lounge for you to try in the evening. 
And I also tried the plant in Fleurs with gray goose, rosé, and blackberry. This was such a rich and beautiful color and had some great flavor as well, but it was still light and refreshing, exactly what I needed to start the evening. But two pieces of advice for y'all that'll improve this experience tenfold. First off, try coming here to the rose when the sun is starting to set. The lounge is surrounded by windows, so your view across the water is going to be gorgeous in the fading light. And second, you may be better off visiting this lounge earlier in the evening than late at night. If you come here after dark and after the final show lets out, the place will be packed. So if you want a more relaxing experience, come at sunset instead. Okay, it's time to go into Palo. I was so excited when Disney announced that Palo was going to add on a steakhouse element to its already incredible Italian offerings. Palo isn't a new concept for the Disney Cruise Line, but Palo Steakhouse is. Because this is Cogsworth's restaurant, expect to see lots of clockwork decor and inspo around the dining room, but not like in a full-on steampunk sense. They'll be more along the lines of ornate. So polished wood floors and shiny metal details with pops of circular color and gold accents here and there. Now there are only two menu options available here, but one is a prefix, the other is a la carte. So you still got that freedom of choice like you do at Enchante. And it is a combo of the Italian favorites from Palo on the other ships and the Steakhouse Edition. Now this is a cheaper dining experience than Enchante with a menu that features both Italian eats and modern steakhouse options, but cheaper doesn't mean poorer quality and also doesn't mean inexpensive. We still loved the options that we tried over here. The sliced herbed yellowfin tuna was super flavorful, especially if you got a little forkful of every option featured on the plate at once. Individually, they're good and together they're powerful. The prosciutto di parma basil and burrata pizza, and I'll just let you take a second to let this giant ball of cheese on top of a pizza sink in, was a great option for pickier eaters who still wanna eat fancy because fancy pizza is still pizza. Now I ordered my favorite Palo option from the other ships, the mushroom risotto, because you all know how much I love wet rice and this is some of the best wet rice out there. And the pastas are still excellent here too. There are a lot of repeat options that you'll find at other Palos on other ships as well. And that six ounce Japanese A5 Wagyu strip loin, mic drop, literally wrap up, go home. There is no contest. This Wagyu was phenomenal. Honestly, I liked it better than the Wagyu I had over at Enchante and better than the Wagyu I had at Victoria and Albert's pre-COVID closures. It was truly exquisite and well worth the purchase. Absolutely melt in your mouth, tender and buttery and worth the 45 bucks I spent on it. But this is a steakhouse after all, so I'm glad it's out there living up to its name. Also, heads up that the Steakhouse Edition means that you get the option of ordering Steakhouse sides. And how could I not order the Cavatappi, which was basically the creamiest mac and cheese ever. I mean, look at this. When a fancy restaurant doesn't take itself too seriously and lets me have mac and cheese like this, I am a happy, happy diner. Now we can talk about the broccolini here too, but why would we? And as you would expect from Palo, even the desserts were out here impressing us. For those who are Palo fans from before, no worries, the souffles are still here, both chocolate and amaretto, and you still have to order them 20 minutes early. And based on the other desserts we tried, which were fine, but not excellent, go ahead and order the souffles. And yes, I did have the carrot cake and it was okay, but not destination worthy. Had a weird like gel on the top. And of course at Palo, you've also got quite an impressive wine list. And that's true at Enchante as well. So I could rave on about this restaurant, but instead I'll just say that once again, the Disney wish is setting the bar high with the gourmet dining. If you want fancy, delicious food, but don't necessarily want to spend over a hundred bucks on a prefix meal, then Palo Steakhouse may be more worth it for you. However, there are a lot of super unique options and flavors going on at Enchante that you might want to try. Alrighty, at this point, as I noted before, Buckbeak is in danger and Cassie and I are legit running like headless chickens to get all the time sensitive stuff. But it was time for 1923 and rotational dining waits for no man or woman as the case may be. So when it comes to Disney Cruise Line's rotational dining, there's always one option in the trio that presents itself as a little higher end than the rest. And on the Disney Wish, it's 1923. You know how I'm always talking about how much Steakhouse 71 at Disney's Contemporary Resort celebrates the Walt Disney legacy? Well, 1923 aboard the Disney Wish dialed that up by like 5,000. Okay, maybe that's not quite fair. Where Steakhouse 71 celebrates the opening of Walt Disney World, 1923 celebrates the year when the Walt Disney Company was founded, which led to all the animated Disney films we know and love today. Now, if you love Disney history, you're going to love the atmosphere here, but even casual Disney fans are still going to find a major appreciation for the display cases that are filled with thousands of different movie props and movie concept art featured around the restaurant. 
So when you think of this restaurant, think a sophisticated artsy museum intertwined with old Hollywood vibes, all while celebrating the evolution of Disney animation. Quick side note though, don't let the word sophisticated intimidate you. Though this is a fancier setting than the first two rotational dining restaurants, it's definitely not the fanciest restaurant aboard the ship, and there are gonna be plenty of people here in their jeans and tennis shoes, so don't worry about pulling out your nicest evening gown or full-on tux for this one. But I will say, unlike Arendelle and Marvel, there's no overarching story here. You're not celebrating an engagement or testing a bunch of high-tech superhero gadgets, so kids might find this restaurant a lot slower. It's also cramped. On The Wish, they added a stage to the Grand Hall, which is usually where the fancy rotational dining restaurant is located. So 1923 has been cut in half, the Roy half and the Walt half, with a hallway in the middle. As such, it makes the restaurant feel uncomfortably crowded, in my opinion. I have no tips or tricks to help you out of that situation, but I want you to be aware. Now, the food here is a bit fancier than what you're gonna find at the two other rotational dining locations, but it's still accessible for just about everyone. I was excited to try the pulled guinea hen corn chowder, because I always love a corn chowder. It's got some potatoes and poultry that do not mess around. And the Hyperion four cheese tricolor tortelloni appetizer was good, but tiny. There's like three little tortellonis. If you're looking for an even bigger pasta fix though, there's the Tortiglioni pasta entree, which is a meatless option with Prosecco cream, yum, fresh tomatoes, lemony herbs, and flavorful mushrooms. But they don't just have pastas here. You've got racks of lamb, filet mignon, butternut squash, even vegetarian tacos. It's a nice flavorful variety for sure, but nothing here is too terribly out there flavor-wise, which is probably good news for pickier eaters, but maybe a bummer for more adventurous palates. The extra cost drinks are pretty fun here, like the Buena Vista Boulevardier with Woodford chocolate rye, Campari, and, and Lille Rouge. How old school does that sound, right? When the drink comes to your table, it'll have a piece of chocolate sitting on top, and when you take the chocolate off, a light steam comes flowing out of the glass. Now that's a drink presentation. The Boulevardier was a bit on the stronger side of things, but it was actually one of our favorite tasting cocktails aboard the ship. And yet again, the dessert at 1923 is nothing to write home about. Is it classy looking? Yes. Is it memorable? No. It was my job to eat all of it because the team had to check in over at Hyperspace for our reservation. And I'll be honest, after having eaten all those souffles at Palo and knowing what true unicorns they are, the desserts at 1923 pretty much fell flat. Now, in general, I love the theming at 1923. Walt and Roy deserve their due, and I'm so glad that this restaurant wasn't just handed over to yet another Disney character. It's a joy as a Disney fan to be able to take in all of the concept art and artist elements throughout the restaurant, but just prep your kiddos and let them know that their dining experience here isn't going to be featuring any Disney queens or Marvel characters that can shrink down to the size of an ant. Ooh, okay, we did it. We ate everywhere on The Wish. And I think our video editor, Carla, is really, really happy that I'm finally done. Before this video, you might have thought, how different could dining aboard the Disney Wish really be? All the other ships are so similar. But now you know the truth. Though there are definitely familiar eats and drinks that mirror some other Disney Cruise Line options, The Wish has so many more restaurants, so many fresh ways to dine, with new entertainment options, new menu varieties, and new Disney-themed atmospheres to explore. Now, if you stuck with me this long, congrats and thank you. Usually, Bria keeps my scripts more concise, but on this one, I let it all hang out. So I appreciate you saving Buckbeak with us. Do you have other questions about dining on The Wish or the Disney Cruise Line in general? Let me know in the comments. So I won't go on any further. I'm sorry to have rambled so long. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.